Hey guys, it's Layla from Ignite, and in this video, I'm gonna take you through some of the key contextual features which impact Stephen Doldry's film, The Hours, an adaptation of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. If you haven't watched our content before, let me just flag that this content today is going to be explicitly referencing the HSC model textual conversations, looking explicitly at Wolf and Doldry. Nonetheless, if you're someone who just wants a bit of contextual knowledge on Stephen Doldry's text, this content will be invaluable to you. I'm going to take you through two key contextual features which impact his film. Now, if you are doing the HSC, the reason we're looking at context is because when you do your comparison of Wolf and Doldry, you have to consider how context has implicated the conveying of meaning between these two texts. For example, if you've got a certain idea that is conveyed in Mrs. Dalloway and you want to compare its progression to the hours, and I will talk a lot about this, you want to discuss how context has impacted that change in the representation, how there are resonances and dissonances between these two texts and how context really feeds into that. Okay, so here's a quote from the rubric, have a read of it, and that's just really the justification of why I'm going through context with you guys today. But as a starting point, these are my two contextual features that I'd like to go through. If you've watched my video on intertextuality, if not, I recommend you do, you'd be familiar with the term post-structuralism, which is a contextual feature of Doldry's literary world, which feeds really specifically into the form that he directs in his text. So I'm gonna talk about that. And the second concept I wanna talk about is queer theory. And if you've watched my video on context in Wolf, I talk a little bit about psychoanalysis and suppressed sexual desire. And that's a nice point that you can compare to queer theory because this is like the development of that notion of the text and how it progresses into the hours, particularly in relation to lesbian desire. Alrighty, so with relation to post-structuralism. So post-structuralism basically is this idea about intertextuality, which is circulating during Stephen Doldry's context. So it refers to this notion that there are relationships between texts and how these relationships inform our understanding. So on a broader level, it's basically what you're looking at in this module, right? How your understanding of the hours has helped to extend your understanding of Mrs. Dalloway. And the reason I bring it up in relation to context is because it is because of this awareness of intertextuality that Doldry is embodying a form that is in and of itself on a metatextual level intertextual, okay? He's made a text that is an adaptation. It takes elements of Mrs. Dalloway and it reappropriates it into three contextual paradigms, okay? On one hand, you've got the contextual narrative of Virginia Woolf herself in the creation of the text. So there is an explicit reference to the composer of Mrs. Dalloway. The next level is you've got the narrative strand of Laura Brown in her reading of Mrs. Dalloway. And in fact, in the shots of the film, you have her explicitly holding the novel, okay? Intertextuality, which is the reference to other texts, doesn't get more explicit than that, okay? So this aspect of the text form is a reflection of post-structuralism. Doldry is interested in intertextuality because it's part of his literary context. The final one, of course, the final narrative strand, there are three narrative strands in the hours, is the story of Clarissa Vaughan. Clarissa Vaughan is the modern implied embodiment of Mrs. Dalloway. Everything that she couldn't be in the text is showcased through Clarissa Vaughan. And I will talk about that more in the queer theory concept, but just to foreground a little bit earlier on, that suppressed desire, the sexual desire of Mrs. Dalloway, becomes the platform of Clarissa Vaughan's relationship. All right, so that development in context, how it reshapes our understanding of Mrs. Dalloway, that is intertextuality. And the reason it is so explicit in Doldry's text as an adaptation is because of his awareness of post-structuralism. So that's our first contextual feature, post-structuralism and how it impacts the form of the text. And I've already flagged the three narrative strands, okay, and how his awareness of post-structuralism has informed our understanding of each of the narrative strands in the text, how he reappropriates explicitly the notion of Wolf into the traces of narratives within his text. Okay, the second one is the notion of queer theory. Now, this literary and gender studies concept was quite big in the 90s, and it also feeds into the representation of characters in all of the narrative strands in the text. 
this notion of queer theory is actually also an explicit, I guess, extension of post-structuralism, if you like, because it actually feeds on some of the elements of post-structuralism as well. Now, queer theory was an idea that originated in the 90s, and it kind of reshaped our understanding of sexuality in the literary world. And when I say literary world, because it's very kind of a, a literary critic term, it helps us understand why Doldry portrays the characters in the way he does, particularly the character of Clarissa Vaughan. So queer theory was kind of like treating the body as a text in the post-structural sense, which is to say that it reads the body's sexual attraction in more of a fluid way as opposed to categorising it. If you watched the intertextuality video, I spoke quite a bit about how meaning in a text is not confined. It's fluid and it's constantly changing. And queer theory saw sexuality in the same way. To say that somebody is queer is to say that they don't categorise their sexuality. It's rather quite fluid. And this presence of queer theory in direct opposition to how lesbianism was suppressed in Wolf's context is a really great contrast point to understand the differences between these two worlds. So just think about that, queer theory embracing the body as fluid and seeing sexual relationships as not categorised. And that, as I mentioned, is specifically channeled through the character of Clarissa Vaughan, but does also come through in Laura Brown. But what I will say about Clarissa Vaughan, if you think about all of her relationships in the text, they're really quite complex and they're hard to categorise. On one hand, she's absolutely obsessed with Richard and she treats him in a very maternal way. But the nature of their relationship is supposed to be platonic. He's her friend, right? But there are references later on in the text that they shared that kiss in their youth. There is that sexual narrative to their backstory. So we can't really categorise her relationship as either platonic or sexual. The fact that we can't categorise it is, to me, an explicit gesture towards queer theory. So the context feeds into it in that way. Her relationship with Lewis Waters. Lewis Waters is meant to be the reincarnation of Peter Walsh from Mrs Dalloway, a character we know Mrs Dalloway had some kind of flirtation with. Yet in this text, Peter Walsh is gay. He has his own kind of, uh, how would we say, not categorised relationship with his student that he teaches in the drama school. He himself is an example of queer theory because if he did have an implied relationship with Clarissa, that one was heterosexual and now he's homosexual. So this confusion about sexual identities and categories is very queer, right? We can't categorise it. Doldry challenges us to think about sexuality in a different way, which is exactly what queer theory was doing at the time. And of course, there's the obvious example of Clarissa and her partner, who's escaped me at this moment, Sally. Of course it's Sally. Sally because Sally was the partner of Mrs. Dalloway, the suppressed partner in the original text. But now she's openly in a, in a relationship with her. So that development of sexuality shows an acceptance in the queer theory realm and how that contextual feature has fed into this aspect of the text. So I'm going to leave it there. They're my two key contextual points and I've tried to pick ones that have a bit of a nuance to them to really distinguish you from other students. So the post-structuralism, how that feeds into the form of the text and the queer theory and its very queered representation of sexuality. Please comment. I know there were some tricky ideas in there and I'll do my best to reply to them. But most of all, subscribe because if you like this, there'll be more coming your way. Thanks, guys. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching once again. If you are enjoying our content and we hope you are, please do like and subscribe to our channel. And of course, share with your friends. That's right guys, thanks for watching. But please do make sure you check out our very special resources. They're quite unique. We've made a whole bunch of state rank practical guides for all your English texts out there. So check out the link now at ignitehsc.com.au. Let us know what you think. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next video.